Ecology shapes our preferences for where to live. That's why so many of us want to live where there's plenty of life, variety, harmony, efficiency, enclosure, and perspective. Today we'll try to understand these drives and how building styles attempt to satisfy them to compete in a world where people have choices, especially since one of these choices is sustainable living. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. Let's expand on this list. We want to live where there's plenty of life, a need that harkens back to our primal need for food security. What's a lively environment? Well, first of all, it's an environment that exists at a human scale, a place that we can easily move around in without getting trapped or lost. Ideally, this would also be a place with rounded edges rather than sharp edges that could hurt you, with organic materials suggesting the presence of life and therefore food sources. And of course, our need for life also drives our desire for landscaping, houseplants, pets, contact with nature, and room to breathe. But it can't all just be one kind of life. We also need variety, meaning a diverse habitat. This too comes from our need for food security. We like to live in a place where there's a range of shapes, colors, and textures, with unexpected finds everywhere and places to explore. We like multifunctional spaces that stretch resources. But of course, there is such a thing as too much variety, and that's why we also like harmony. Just as much as we like variety in our environment, we also crave clarity, order, and structure. These are deep drives that trace back to our revulsion for trash, which itself comes from a fear of pests and parasites that trash harbors. Most of us don't like hoarding, which limits our freedom as a semi-nomadic species. Now look, I realize this is hard in our consumer culture, where we express our love with gifts. So our desire for harmony, our desire for structure and order is complicated. We don't like randomness where we live because it looks trashy, confusing, and wasteful of our time. With harmony, it's much easier to achieve our next want, efficiency. We don't like to live somewhere that wastes land, energy, and material resources. And again, this harkens back to our need for food security. Unfortunately, our drive for efficiency in our environment has been hijacked by the trillions of dollars that have been spent on advertising. These target another one of our biological needs, the need for status, by trying to link it to big, single-use private spaces and exotic materials such as gold and basically a whole vocabulary of design and form that's tied to our classist and colonial urges. How do we get around this strong countercurrent against our natural inclination towards efficiency? Our main tool is to build to share more. Sharing is the basis of ecological efficiency, as well as trade, commerce, wealth creation, in short, the basis of wealth in both ecology and economics. How do you know that the place you live is built for sharing? Well, one metric I like to use is the lawnmower quotient. Take the number of people in the region where you live, divide it by the number of lawnmowers. A rough estimate is fine, and that gives you your lawnmower quotient. I've lived in places with lawnmower quotients as low as two and as high as perhaps a thousand or more. The ones with the bigger number win. Now, as much as we like efficiency, we also like enclosure and perspective because we want to live somewhere where we're both protected from the elements and able to see competitors at a distance before they can do us any harm. These are cozy, safe places with a view. This is why many people throughout the world prefer to live in places that are maybe a couple of stories tall, but not dozens or hundreds of stories tall. Our need for enclosure and perspective can also be addressed by chunking our social spaces. In his book Happy City, Charles Montgomery made the point through many examples about how jarring it is for people to live where doors just open up onto a street with thousands of other doors. This is really a stressful way to live. A much better way to live is to design our environments where your door opens onto a lobby or courtyard with maybe four or five other doors. In these environments with more limited contact, you have a lot more control over who you see every day. And study after study has shown that you make more friends and your neighbors don't stay strangers for long. We also address our need for enclosure and perspective by creating privacy gradients. This is why we don't go straight to the bedroom from the street. We go from the street to the porch, to the family room, to the bedroom. This gives us a sense of increasing control over our increasingly intimate environments. How do we apply these ecological drivers to building form? Let's look at a few styles of townhouse. This row of houses, built in the international style, is where I lived for about six years as a child in Detroit. It was designed by Mies van der Rohe and built between 1959 and 1964. 
It was a mixed-use townhouse high-rise development around a park. It had peripheral parking, and because of its design, it ticked a lot of our boxes. It was a place built on the human scale. It was brimming with life, with clear views of the outdoors, and easy access to the park. You could just open the door and walk out and be in the park among the trees and birds. It appealed to our desire for variety because living here, you could walk to the park, to a school, to shopping, all without encountering a car because the whole development was built with peripheral parking. It was also wonderful to watch the weather and wildlife and the seasons changing from those giant floor-to-ceiling windows. It satisfied our desire for harmony because of its clean design and because it was professionally maintained. It felt efficient because of the central heat and cooling. The lawnmower quotient was about 100. There was about one lawnmower per 100-ish people. It was a big park, but again, it was centrally maintained. The two stories and joined up nature of the construction were good for efficiency, but it would have been better going at least one more story and putting in some mixed use development on the ground floor. And of course, the roofs didn't have solar panels or rooftop gardens. And these days, they're shaded in by the surrounding trees. But the trees do function as a windbreak, which reduces heating and cooling costs. It satisfied our desire for enclosure and perspective because the peripheral parking kept the park safe. Every room of these townhouses also had wonderful city skyline and park views. Should we do more of these? Well, maybe. If we add that third story, add a rooftop garden, which would be super easy because of the all-in-one boxy construction. Today, something like this could easily be built to passive house standards, especially if we shrunk the windows a bit and added opaque or holographic dots at intervals to deter birds. Now, there are many other types of townhouses. There's the Victorian row houses of San Francisco, the Baroque canal houses of Amsterdam, a wide range of neoclassical and modernist row houses in cities throughout the world, and of course, the gorgeous and colorful Catalan modernism exemplified in the works of Gaudi. In the older parts of many American cities, including here in Columbus, you'll find brownstones with residences over commercial spaces. One way that these can be developed was where the owner owns both the residential and commercial space and maybe lives upstairs and either uses the downstairs for their business or rents it out to somebody else. Now, in Edenicity, this could lend itself to an owner-built, owner-designed, maybe even community-designed village of brownstones. Something like this was actually done in village homes in Davis, California, but it was mostly single-family homes that were owner-built and designed with a lot of community input. This is a process that J.H. Crawford recommends in his book, Carfree Design Manual, and it hasn't been done that often. It is pretty rare to find a whole community of people willing to design not just their homes, but their community together in a massive charrette. Now, in Edenicity, all of these designs would work, but for professional food growing on the roofs, it's important to connect the roofs for ease of access. They don't all have to be on one level, but it helps. Speaking of one level, let's look at the extreme opposite end, where you have joined up housing with many, many different levels. This is Habitat 67. It was actually Mosh Safdie's master's thesis at McGill University School of Architecture. It was built for the 1967 World's Fair in Montreal. Out of hundreds of reinforced 62 square meter, that's about 624 square foot, concrete boxes built on site in a custom factory. They were assembled into the perforated pyramids that you see here, with each unit angled for privacy. Apartments comprise one to eight units, each with a patio that is part of another apartment's roof. Now, if it looks like a set of Legos, Mr. Safdie admitted that he bought every Lego in Montreal to build his early models. 50 years later, this is still inhabited, just like Lafayette Park. There's been very little turnover, and despite its very imposing exterior, this development has a very strong sense of community. This is a very important point. Livability is not always the same as attractiveness. Built in the middle of the St. Lawrence River with amazing river and skyline views, the interiors are beautiful, but it was never cheap. Rents were several times market rate initially, and now it's ultra gentrifying. Maintenance is very costly because the geometry and materials are just not great for a cold, wet climate. Something like this might be better suited for a place like Singapore, where it may have actually inspired the interlace. Let's talk about the aesthetics 
of Habitat 67. This is actually the brutalist example of the architectural style known as brutalism. And I have to say, I have literally had nightmares about places like this for years. All that bare, unadorned concrete just seems incredibly cold and hard and angular and devoid of life. So here's what I did. I asked AI to redo it in the more colorful, organic style of Gaudi. Here's what it came up with. What do you think? All right, last time I mentioned Big Dumb Boxes, which appeared on a recent episode of Type Ashton, see the link in the description, who mentioned a recent article called In Defense of Big Dumb Boxes by Michael Eliason. I've linked his article in the description. It's well worth a read. In the article, he made the case that the big dumb boxes, that is to say, low-rise apartments of two to six floors without embellishments, are low-carbon, durable, and affordable. But as multiple viewers have commented, big dumb boxes can be sterile and lack character. And people were very animated on this subject. There were a lot of very detailed suggestions for much more enjoyable alternatives to the big dumb box. So I had a little fun with it. I took what they wrote and threw it into AI and used it as a prompt to generate these images. What do you think? Now, we might actually see something like this in a future where we have durable, carbon-negative, 3D-printed materials in abundance sourced from the local landscape. But what can we do between now and our sort of idealized utopian future? How can we systematically add variety and cultural continuity to the big dumb box? The parameters that we have to work with are arrangement, shape, color, landscaping, materials, and decoration. Of these, I'd say the most overlooked when people are thinking about these topics is arrangement. Even with very simple cubes, it's possible to arrange them in such a way that they create an amazing amount of visual variety and unexpected vistas. This is cul-de-sac, a thousand unit car-free development in Tempe, Arizona. Now, working in tandem with arrangement, we can vary shape. Mykonos in the Greek islands, for example, has all these lovely rounded organic shapes to it, which are part of the vernacular architecture that is the traditional non-academic architecture of the region that uses local materials. And notice that it achieves incredible amount of, of variety with minimal use of color. Notice how alive this, this village is with hardly any use of color. A monochromatic color scheme can go really far in unifying an environment. Then we can add color accents, as cul-de-sac does magnificently, to signify transitions and to unify and define separate spaces. We can also use large fields of color to great effect. The richer, deeper shades in the colder climates, lighter tints and whites in hot climates. But as always, when we're using color, we're looking for variety, contrast, and nuance without it becoming so jumbled up and wild that we lose our sense of harmony and order. Our next tool is landscaping. This starts with arrangement, where the street widths, courtyards, and building separations vary by climate. You want the buildings closer together in hot climates, so there's more shade. You want sun-facing windows in cool climates. As for plants in the landscape, food-secure landscaping varies enormously by climate, and I'm planning a whole series of episodes on that, so be sure you're subscribed. What about materials? That, too, is really a topic of at least one additional episode, and I'll link it right here when it's ready. But for now, our ecological drivers are to, as much as possible, use locally sourced, low-carbon materials with appropriate levels of insulation and breathability. But here I have to caution you that there are lots of good ideas about materials that don't work out very well in practice, depending on the climate. And I look forward to sharing those stories with you in an episode coming soon. But because not all of these ideas work out well in practice, we need to be cautious. How do we do that? First, take cues from local time-tested materials and vernacular styles. That is to say, the folk architecture of the region. If people have been using certain materials for a really long time, there's a pretty good chance that they know what they're doing. In particular, an application of this would be if you are really excited about, for example, rammed earth houses, and there are none in your region, and your region has some history behind it, there's probably a good reason for that, and you should proceed with caution. Finally, we come to decoration. The things that I've been most impressed with over the years have been facades with local materials, styles, and motifs, and some that speak to that history, even though they're brand new, like Kayalat in Guatemala that was recently profiled by the Aesthetic City. I'll put the link in the description. The problem with embellishment is that it does require a higher degree of skill, but as 3D printed homes with carbon negative materials such as hempcrete become more common, it may become economical to print organic embellishments and motifs anywhere on a structure. 
I had a little bit of fun with this, with AI. Where does all that leave us with Edenicity? Remember our goal, cities that end the mass extinction. How do we do this? First, by shrinking our land use a lot, up to 96%. And second, by making it attractive enough that most people choose to live in these cities. Happily enough, the best strategies I've been able to chase down to achieve goal number one also help enormously with goal number two. In many other episodes in this series, I've shown how car-free, high-density garden-to-cafe construction provides a really healthy, safe, unhurried, enjoyable lifestyle. Low rises with rooftop gardens, two to three residential floors, and ground floor workspace, or shared amenities, are attractive to us because ecology does so much to shape our aesthetics. We love spaces that are built at the human scale, that brim with life, that do more than one thing, that are made to be shared. But since you're still here, I'm curious to know what you think. Let us know in the comments whether you prefer apartments or townhouses, owner-built or not, and I'm especially curious about your aesthetics. What arrangements, shapes, colors, plantings, and decorations would make your perfect community? So much to talk about, so much to dream about. Take care, stay green, see you next time.